this screencast will make up for our missed day uh, due to the snow. Um, we're going to start talking about some of the works of art that we'll be dealing with in class. And the university administration has required that all classes have some sort of activity uh, to make up for the missed class time. Uh, in other words, you're getting what you pay for. Um, as you play this back, you should take notes. Uh, it's really important to take notes both in class um, and while you're reading. In fact, psychological studies have shown that when you take notes by hand rather than typing them, you, you actually process the information and, and begin to make it part of your knowledge rather than simply something that you've heard. So I highly recommend uh, that, you, that you get a pen and paper and take notes while you're doing this because indeed there is a questionnaire that you'll need to fill out uh, to prove to me that you've actually engaged with this material. So take a minute or so and, and, and find yourself a, a pen and paper. Hit the pause button and, and come back when you've got things to take notes with. That said, uh, what we're looking at here are two works of art from the National Gallery. Um, NGA stands for National Gallery of Art. It's currently closed because of the government shutdown. Uh, but once it's opened up, you can get down there and see a really terrific uh, collection of works. Uh, we're very fortunate here in D.C. to have such a really great uh, group of museums, not only here but also up in Baltimore, um, most of which are free. And uh, those will be the primary uh, stuff that our, our class will focus on. And what we're looking at here are two different Italian paintings um, from the middle or late part of the 13th century, the 1200s. And you can see that they're very, very similar. They're two different versions of what was a really common theme in Italian art of the 13th century. It's the Virgin Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, the Madonna, uh, my Our Lady uh, in, in, in Italian, and, the, and, and Jesus sitting on her lap. Uh, you'll notice as you look at them uh, that they're very, very similar. Poses are, are really quite similar. Each one of them, she has her hand around the, the hips of Christ, and each one of them, Christ gestures uh, with two fingers. Uh, some minor differences. He looks out at us on the left. He looks at his mom on the right. Uh, but if you look at the placement of her second hand, her proper right hand on your left, you'll notice that it's also an incredibly similar pose in both of them, with three fingers together and one, and one apart. Uh, in each, she's seated on a throne, and in each, uh, we have angels appearing in little circles, what we might call a roundel, uh, behind her two shoulders. Uh, so it's a, it's a really co pretty common theme with, with a significant number of similarities. There's no real attempt to tell a story in this. Um, it's not a narrative scene. It's more like a portrait, if you will. Right? It's not a, a, a scene from a sequence of actions. Uh, but we do know from looking at this that um, it's meant to be a sort of visionary experience for you, the viewer. Uh, like we're looking into heaven itself with the angels and the virgin. And in fact, the throne itself is intended to be the throne of heaven. The virgin is the queen of heaven. Um, even though it's heaven, Christ still appears as an infant, as he did at the very beginning of his earthly life. Now... At this point, so far, I'm talking about subject matter. Um, there's a $10 word for that in art history, iconography, which basically means subject matter. Icon means image, graphy, uh, what's in the image, a graph of things. You could think about it that way. And uh, this discussion of subject matter, this identification of exactly what we're looking at, is one of the primary things that we do in an art history class. Um, and that's what we're going to spend a lot of our time doing um, in this class, is discussing subject matter. But in an art history class, we take this discussion a step further. We want to try to put this subject matter into some sort of historical context. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do next, is sort of talk about uh, what this subject matter might have meant, what these pictures, these paintings might have meant to someone in the late 13th century in Italy, this historical context. This is the history part of art history. So uh, the first thing to note with both of these is that we know that they were both altarpieces. Now that might be a term that you're not as really familiar with. 
An altarpiece is a painting that uh, adorned an altar in a church. Uh, churches often had numerous altars. There'd be one at the high altar where you would receive mass in the center of churches. But there are also side chapels in, in most Italian churches, and those too would have had a painting that uh, stood behind the altar uh, when the priest was uh, performing the mass. And they were available, of course, during off hours as well. You could go see them anytime you wanted to. Uh, but the primary function of works of art like this, altar pieces, was to uh, give the viewer during the mass ceremony an image that would help them to focus their attention. So it's important for us seeing these in a museum context or for you at home on your computer or when we're sitting in the classroom at Marymount uh, to think about these works as they were originally seen. And that would have been within a church setting behind an altar and primarily designed to be seen uh, while the priest is performing the communion ceremony, the mass ceremony. And they are there for you, the viewer, to remember Christ's sacrifice, but also uh, your own salvation that would let you join the virgin and child, the Madonna and child, um, in heaven. The fact that these were altar pieces accounts for the subject matter, of course. Uh, one of the things we know from looking at the liturgy and various religious writings in Italy and actually throughout Europe was that there was an increased focus on the mother of Jesus, the Virgin Mary, from the 12th century onward. This is something that's difficult to explain. No one said exactly why, but there was a huge upswing in uh, uh, religious focus on, on, on Mary, uh, almost co-equal to Christ, um, as a focus for our, our, our devotions and our prayers. And at the same time we see that happening, we also see that in Italy, in the 1200s, this idea of using altarpieces was a brand new practice. And this is another thing that's kind of important to remember. Right? So the works of art that we're looking at here are sort of new as a, uh, as a kind of art that one would see in Italy in the 13th century. And also they reflect a, a change in, in focus, a, a, an increased focus on the Virgin Mary. Um, because altarpieces were relatively new as a practice in, in the 1200s, one of the things that artists in Italy did was to borrow older prototypes and rely on them to invent, if you will, a new kind of art. And in this case, they looked to a very long and well-established tradition of imagery that came from Eastern Europe from the Byzantine Empire, which are called icons, Byzantine icons. And these can be traced all the way back to the 6th or 7th century. Smaller pictures, sometimes not adorning altars. Uh, you can see that here the Virgin Mary is in half length rather than full length. There's no setting whatsoever. But at the same time, you can see that the placement of the hand on Christ's thigh uh, the other hand, uh, the panel's been damaged at the bottom, but the other hand, uh, beneath his hips, Christ holding a small scroll of paper, gesturing in a similar way with his hands. All of these things are shared between these two works of art from different centuries and different regions. And that's because our Italian painter on the right is, in fact, uh, borrowing these traditions. This was a really established form of imagery. And the reason he's looking to this particular tradition, Byzantine icons, is that Italy had, in fact, been part of the Byzantine Empire all the way through the 11th, even the early 12th century, right around 1100. Uh, numerous parts of Italy were, were, in fact, part of the Byzantine Empire. So there were quite a few contacts between Italy and the place where works like this continued to be produced. Um, and these uh, connections continued into the 13th century with trade connections by sea uh, between Italy and, and Eastern Europe, what is today Greece, Bulgaria, Turkey. Uh, these connections continued very, very strongly uh, during the time that this work was made. These Byzantine icons account for the similarities that we saw 
with these two Italian works in the National Gallery. Uh, the hand placements, the poses, the gestures. All of these things come from a shared tradition uh, that our Italian artists are, are picking up. There are, however, within this a few, a few differences. You'll notice, for example, the colors change uh, from the one on the right to the one on the left. Uh, like the centerpiece, the one on the right, the Virgin Mary wears blue. The blue has darkened significantly in both the center and the right works, more so than on the left because the pigment uh, is made up of minerals, some of which um, change over time as they oxidize. And that's happened to the two on the right, but it's a different mineral in the painting on the left. And so, of course, the color is preserved better. Uh, they do wear different colors. Um, the thrones are different in our, in our two works as well. Uh, square on the right and round, rounded on the left. When we talk about these sorts of differences, um, the choice of full length over half length, uh, the choices of colors, uh, the way in which the throne is handled. Here, we're beginning to talk about a different issue that's an important one for art history, which is what we call style. These are uh, artistic choices that make the same thing, in this case, the pretty much the same subject matter, look the same or, or look different. These are, these are choices that the artist make, makes. Stylist, style is a, is a choice made by the artists, usually based on traditions or conventions. Sometimes uh, the style is mandated by the patron. So that's another thing that we'll be talking about a lot in art history, right? We talked about subject matter, iconography, and style uh, is another issue because we're really learning to look uh, learning to look at works of art and, and really determine what we're seeing. So uh, here we're talking about style. And when we talk about style, we're sort of describing uh, these idiosyncrasies, if you will, uh, from work to work, where the same subject matter can appear, in fact, drastically different uh, from work to work. Um, and in this case, uh, the style uh, can lead us to a, a discussion of the arti artist's materials. Uh, the term we use, uh, and terminology is a key thing, right? The term that we use in art history to talk about artist's materials is the medium. Uh, this is the basis of the modern word media, uh, very much in the news these days, in the media, if you will. Uh, media is the plural of medium. Mediums are media. So uh, artist materials are media. And in this particular case, um, here's a nice close-up of the one on the right. And you can see the blue is not as dark as it seemed at first. Cameras have a difficult time with things with a gold background. They tend to silhouette them a bit more than they will. Most of these are my photos, and I I'm getting better at it slowly but surely. Um, the medium here is uh, the kind of paint that's being used is called egg tempera paint. What egg tempera paint is, is, well, all paint is the ground up material, uh, the ground up color, if you will. This is usually something like plant material or, or minerals, or sometimes even living material like beetles, uh, uh, in fact, make a really nice red. Uh, but these are then stirred into some sort of liquid uh, material that allows you then to uh, apply it to, to your surface. And in this case, uh, the liquid material that the uh, uh, pigment is, is is stirred into is, in fact, egg yolk. And egg yolk, uh, egg tempera, dries very, very opaque. It dries quickly. Um, you tend to paint it on uh, in, in small dashes and small little lines, which you can eventually see. So this is part of our discussion of style, is to talk about the medium that the artist is choosing. In this case, it's a traditional medium. There's no sort of innovation on the artist's part uh, with this. Um, at the same time, uh, the background is not egg tempera. The background is, in fact, gold leaf, a very, very thin layer of gold that has been first hammered to uh, thinner than tissue paper and then uh, laid onto the surface. So you could actually scratch it off if you got in there with a knife. Not that you would want to do that, 
and uh, it covers the entire background. You can also see um, in the background, uh, I'll try and do this right in, right in here, you can see the halo around the outside of her head, and you can see that that's been incised into the background, and the gold leaf lays on top of that. Uh, the term we use for that is tooling, and if you look off to your left of her head, off her right ear, you can see that there's some uh, patterns even uh, incised into the background that the, the gold leaf has been laid over. The rest of it is the crack pattern that's happened as the painting has dried and uh, moistened and dried and moistened over the years prior to coming to the National Gallery where it's now climate controlled. Okay, so the style has a historical context. The style that we're talking about here um, for one thing, uh, there's a very limited number of colors that we see the Virgin Mary wearing. Red and blue are the primary ones. Also, white comes into play, but that's usually about it. Um, that has an historical context. There's a tradition for that. There's a convention for that. Uh, the use of gold background was uh, traditional at this time and, and, and not extraordinary, uh, something you would expect to see in an altarpiece coming out of those icons that we saw. But one of the things we're going to talk about is the fact that the style also has an effect on the meaning of the work of art. Uh, that there's a connection between these things. That when artists make a choice um, insofar as how they depict works of art, it, it, can, it has the opportunity to change the meaning. So in this case, the choice of gold leaf for the background uh, adds to the symbolism of the scene as being set in heaven. The blue that the Virgin Mary wears on the right is the color of royalty in the late Middle Ages and the early part of the Renaissance. That makes sense given that she's seated on a throne. She wears that same royal blue underneath her red robe on the left. In the Middle Ages, the color blue was also associated with a faithfulness. And that's kind of an important element, and we see this a lot in images of the Virgin Mary with Jesus uh, during this period. The idea of faithfulness. Mary, according to Catholic theology, uh, knows everything. She knows the fate of her son from the moment he's born. She knows he's going to be crucified, going to be tortured to death. And a mother's natural instinct, of course, is to try to protect him. Uh, but she doesn't because she's faithful to his mission. So her faithfulness is to Christ as the Son of God, not Christ as her mortal son. Her faithfulness is to his mission to save mankind. And the blue that we see in these has this dual meaning. In fact, most symbolisms have multiple references. And the blue here can be seen as a sign of royalty, but can also be seen as a sign of her faithfulness to Christ's duty, to his job on earth. Right? Now if we go to the other picture, on the left, we see that that blue of faithfulness, that blue of royalty, is also covered up by red. A very, very deep sort of crimson red. Well, red is a very easy color to put symbolism to. It makes all sorts of sense since it's the color of blood. It is usually the color of pain and suffering, of sorrow. And it's another color that we see the Virgin Mary wearing often because, of course, she knows the fate of her son. And here, even though she's holding him as an infant, even though I guess it's in heaven, right? At the end of time, if you will, it still is a reference to the pain that she feels in her heart for the pain that Christ will eventually suffer in his body. So this really sets us up for what we'll be talking about in class regularly. In art history, we discuss each of the works of art. We try to describe what we're seeing, the subject matter and the style, and then we try to discover uh, what that all meant within its historical context. Uh, subject matter, style, within an historical context. Um, on Canvas, you'll see that there is a study guide for taking notes. And it really gets us into exactly this question in some greater detail. And you can certainly re refer to that uh, as, as class goes on. Now, 
Around the year 1300, we start to see some elements of the style of Italian altar pieces begin to change. Giotto is one of the artists we usually look at when we talk about this change. And you can see his work on the left shares some of the subject matter with the anonymous earlier Italian work on your right. Giotto's work on your left is in the Uffizi Gallery of Florence. She still sits on a throne. She still has the traditional pose where she supports him on one knee, one hand underneath his hip, the other placed in the exact same position on his knee. Christ still carries a scroll of paper and still gestures us with two fingers upraised. All of these things are the same. We still have angels, more of them now, and they've been moved out of those little oculi, those little circles, and have been placed in front and on the sides, in blue and in white, on either side of the throne. So most of this has stayed the same, but what has changed with Giotto's work is the style, right? And in class, we would have sort of discussed this. You would have told me <clears throat> what sort of elements of style you see to be different. It's a little more difficult to do in this uh, venue. So I'll go through a few things that are, that are sort of what people point to there as what is different about Giotto's style. First and foremost is the modeling of the figure. Giotto's figures seem to exist fully in three dimensions. When he paints the figures, they look as if they are rounded, as if uh, they have shading on one side, uh, that they sit as, as, as plausibly three-dimensional figures. Let me go back a slide. If we look at our anonymous Italian work, there is some sense of how the drapery folds around her knees, around her arms, around Christ's hips and shoulders. But if we look at Giotto's work, you'll notice that it's done in a different way. Uh, the early Italian work on your right has either highlights that are gold or the color of the robe, which is blue. And it has all of these sort of linear patterns across it, but nothing much in the way of trying to model it in three dimensions, shade it in sort of gradual tones that move from the highlight to the shadow. And if you look at Giotto's work, there's a sense of bodies beneath these robes, and the robes having this sort of subtle gradation of tone from the highlight to the shadow. Now, keep in mind, again, uh, the blue of the Virgin's robe, which again has that same color symbolism we talked about, it has darkened through time, so it's not nearly as vibrant as it was um, when Giotto painted it. But both the Virgin's body, we can look at the white part of her of her robe, underneath the robe, the, her tunic beneath it, or look at Christ's body, you can see that both of them have a real credible three-dimensional quality, that they're modeled in tones of light and dark. And again, we have a nice $10 term for this, chiaroscuro, which is simply the Italian term for light and dark. Uh, chiaro, light, scuro, dark. And this kind of modeling in three dimensions that we see here, the subtle gradations from light to dark, is what we call in art history chiaroscuro. So this is one of the uh, hallmarks of the changed style with Giotto, is near case in a sense of three-dimensionality, achieved through this chiaroscuro. Right? Uh, the other element that we see, we see this kind of everywhere, right? There's lots, I have lots of details of this. Let's look at the angel in the foreground holding that vase full of flowers. The flowers all have symbolic references as well. They're all meant to be symbols of the Virgin Mary. There's a rose, um, some lilies. Uh, all of these were uh, common symbols for the Virgin Mary for one reason or another. But if we look at the angel's robe for a moment, uh, you can see that in fact it has a real credible three-dimensional quality. The, the folds come down to that belt and then hang down the knees in a way that suggests something that you might actually see in, in reality. Giotto seems quite aware of how he's building up a three-dimensional space, and I like the way that this one apostle on the left, or saint off to the left, we don't quite know who each of them are behind the angels that are offering her, uh, her heavenly crown. Remember that this is the throne of heaven that she's seated on, right? 
uh, but I like how one of the angels is grabbing uh, the uh, the edge of the the throne, sort of hanging on, um, and and particularly like uh, how uh, sorry about that uh, how this fellow here is is looking through the hole on the side of the the throne. There's another one on the other side as well. Uh, Giotto has created a, a quite credible. Uh, three-dimensional space uh, for these figures. It's not just the figures, but it's even the throne itself has a really strong um, three-dimensional quality. And then if we get close in on the Virgin's face, we can see these sort of realistic details as well. Um, the veil over her head, uh, where she's got, uh, has, has some stitching in it with jewels, but it's translucent, and you can see her forehead through it and the edge of her hairline. And even though, you know, the Anatomy is a little, you know, stilted. Uh, her mouth is open, and you can see her teeth. And it's almost as if she's breathing, maybe even getting ready to talk. Uh, back in ancient Greece, uh, someone had written, I think Giotto knew about this story, about the only, you know, the only difference between art and, and reality is that art doesn't talk. And, and, and Giotto's making art that talks. Uh, art that can speak, it can breathe. This is, is quite realistic looking, especially by comparison to what the tradition had been in the, in the 13th century, where things tended to be significantly more flat. Right? So Giotto's coming, uh, making really some, some incredible changes uh, to the traditional styles, keeping some of the traditional subject matter, still keeping that artificial built background, but creating a three-dimensional lifelike image of the Virgin Mary with Christ on her lap. Now we're very fortunate to have a Giotto here. There aren't that many in America. Uh, three or four, I think, in America. We've got one uh, down at the National Gallery, one of the best ones, really, uh, down there. Um, and uh, it's, again, the Virgin and Christ. They're no longer on a throne, but still have that gold background. You can see how the halos have been incised into that background. We talked about that before as the gold leaf is then laid over it. Again, she's wearing uh, blue, this color of faithfulness to Christ's mission. Uh, red underneath it, you can see it's rather quite bright, orangish red um, on either sides of her cheeks. Uh, and again, uh, absolutely realistic. Um, here are the tempera paint that we talked about, that egg tempera paint laid down in these strokes, these sort of cross-hatched strokes. But look at her eyes for a second, and you can see that Giotto is putting shots of red around the, the corners of her eyes and certainly on the lids, as well as bits of blue on the eyeball that give it that sort of liquid uh, sense. He's really very much obviously trying to make it look more realistic, trying to make it look more lifelike. And just like the larger piece, you can see their, their mouth is open. And you can see her teeth, and in fact, you can even underneath her teeth see her tongue uh, there. Uh, between her lips. So again, she's she's a talking image. She, she's trying to speak to us as she looks at us. Two other quick details from this. Um, there's this wonderful little charming detail of Christ holding uh, the Virgin Mary's finger, um, hanging on, if you will, as she holds him up. It's a rather sort of tender little baby thing to do, you know, if you've ever been around a newborn infants, you, know, you stick your finger near them and they grab it, don't they? So here, here's Jesus sort of holding on to mom's finger and it gives it, again, adds to that sense of realistic, lifelike quality that Giotto's achieving in other ways as well. Um, they seem very much like a real mother and child uh, rather than a sort of artificial idea of the queen of heaven uh, removed from our everyday experience. This makes them uh, similar to us. And with one hand, he holds the Virgin Mary's finger, and with the other hand, he's reaching for that flower that she's holding. And this is a kind of an interesting development. We've been talking about style, but here we can talk about subject matter. We can talk about symbolism uh, with this particular work, right, uh, with this particular element. He's reaching for that flower, and that flower is a rose, uh, very similar to one that we saw in the angel's vase in the large altarpiece we just saw before this. Um, it's one of the images or one of the flowers that was seen to be a symbol for the Virgin Mary. And she's carrying it as, a, as her own symbol, if you will. And Jesus is reaching for it because, you know, little kids are interested in the stuff that you hold. And, 
And what she's doing, if you read the gesture, she's pulling it away from his hand, right? And this is a really fascinating thing. First, let's talk about the, the symbolism of the rose. The rose was a symbol of the Virgin Mary. And the reason theologians explain that the rose equaled the Virgin Mary is that the rose was this beautiful, fragrant, soft-petaled flower, absolutely perfect, delicate, but it grew from a thorny branch. And theologians likened the thorny branch to the legacy of sin that came from Adam and Eve. And the beautiful flower is the Virgin Mary who can be sinless despite that legacy. So it made a perfect reference for the Virgin Mary, right? So if we keep in mind that for a medieval audience or 14th, 13th, 14th century audience, uh, the flower is a symbol of the Virgin Mary, but also the stem of the flower is a symbol for uh, the sin of mankind. Jesus is reaching out. He's about to prick his finger on, on, on the thorns. And what's the Virgin Mary doing? She's protecting him, right? She's faithful to his mission. Her job while Jesus is a child is to protect him from, from sin, uh, to protect him from temptations, because he is, in fact, fully human. He could sin. He doesn't. And she's playing her role in that. So he's about to sort of grab onto that thing, and she's protecting him from hurting himself on a very pragmatic level. But over and above that, symbolically, she's keeping him away from sin. And that's a key element of the, of the, the symbolism of, of this particular piece. Now, why Giotto's change? Why did Giotto make this move toward a more realistic kind of art around the year 1300? By the way, he's not the only one who's doing it, so that's a bigger question. It's not just that Giotto, it's, it's a number of Italian artists around 1300 are moving toward a more realistic kind of depiction, illustration. And there are three different ways that we can explain that. Uh, again, it goes back to historical context, that central issue that we're dealing with uh, in uh, art history. Right? So the first thing we can point to is it, it coincides with various changes to society. Giotto was active in the city of Florence. Uh, now, Florence had a very special characteristic at this time. Um, Florence as a city was based on a new... Uh, merchant class, uh, a new urban merchant class. Most uh, of Europe through the Middle Ages had been governed by feudalism. This is where uh, your status in society was based on your birthright. Uh, you were either born to the noble class, the rulers, or you were born to the peasant class, the workers. And there was really no uh, fluidity between these two sectors of society. Feudalism uh, was a system wherein uh, the noble class governed uh, by having the, the peasant class work for them. Um, the peasants were protected by the nobles, but at the same time, uh, the peasants provided the nobles with their food and their income in, in return for that protection. Well, Florence, beginning around the middle of the 12th century, began to uh, break free of the older feudal system. And in Florence, in fact, uh, you could, in fact, make your future. You could make your uh, status in, within the city. And you did that through hard work. Because uh, in Florence, uh, independent from feudalism, uh, merchants more or less ruled the day. In order to be part of the government in Florence, which was, in fact, elective, uh, offshoot of democracy, um, but in order to be part of that, you had to be a merchant. You had to be a member of one of the merchant guilds in Florence. And these are the primary patrons for art, is this new merchant class that we have growing in Florence and in a few other cities uh, in the beginning of the 12th century. So Giotto's piece on the right, even though it was part of an altarpiece in a church, uh, was certainly paid for by members of this new merchant class. And a lot of historians have said that Giotto's interest in realism, Giotto's interest in naturalism, is linked to the tastes of this new group of people who are paying for the pictures. 
that this powerful working class, these people who deal with the bottom line in day-to-day -day life, uh, want works of art that reflect their everyday reality. And Giotto's works seem to come about at the same time we see uh, the rise of this new system of social order, social organization in Italy and in the exact towns where we see that new social order. The second thing that we can point to is changes in religious practice. Uh, the rise of a new kind of religion. And in Florence in particular, but also it's really throughout Italy, it was the rise of what we call the mendicant orders. Now, uh, in the early 13th century, there was, uh, back up, feudalism, nah, back up, I, I got my tongue tied. Um, monasticism, monks, uh, were first founded in Europe around the 6th century AD, St. Benedict. Uh, founded the sort of first religious orders in Western Europe and set up a series of, of rules that monks would behave by. They were supposed to separate themselves from, from the city so that they wouldn't be distracted and tempted, uh, live in the countryside, be more, have a monastery that was more or less self-sufficient, live in small groups, usually 12, 15, right? They would have their own livestock. They would have their own gardens. They would offer shelter to travelers, but they were mostly self-sufficient. And the idea was that they would cloister themselves away, um, pray, uh, devote themselves to God without any sort of distraction. In the early 13th century, there were some attempts to suggest that with this new focus on cities in places like Florence, that monks who had isolated themselves in the countryside were not really doing part of God's work, which is to reach out uh, to those who were in need of salvation. And uh, two different groups of monks, uh, the followers of St. Francis and followers of St. Dominic, um, decided that they would set up their, their monasteries within the cities instead. The Franciscan monks and the Dominican monks, the followers of St. Francis and followers of St. Dominic. And they're what we call the mendicant orders because when you have a monastery inside the city, you don't have the same luxuries you do in the countryside of raising your own livestock of being entirely self-sufficient, that the Franciscans and the Dominicans had to, in fact, uh, beg for uh, donations in order to maintain their monastery. And that's what mendicant means. It's the begging orders, the orders you had to ask for alms uh, in order to keep the monastery open. And the reason they had the monasteries in the cities is that they were no longer entirely isolated. They certainly lived in some isolation, but they would go out and they would preach. Both the, the Franciscans and the Dominicans were preaching orders. They would go to the street corners and they would, they would try to reach out to the, uh, the people of Italy, uh, the people of the Italian cities, uh, preaching to them in the vernacular, in, in Italian rather than Latin, in a language they could understand. And their, their sermons uh, were in fact uh, filled with wonderful, lively detail, some of it not necessarily found in the Bible, but were intended to make the biblical stories relevant to the people in the cities, to make the lives of the saints, the lives of Christ and Mary, uh, similar to the lives of a 13th or 14th century Italian. So if we think about the Franciscans and the Dominicans, we think about the mendicant orders, we can uh, conceive of the fact that this new um, preaching style is, is doing the same thing Giotto's paintings are doing. They're, they're making traditional Christianity more relevant to the onlooker. Uh, the Franciscans, the Dominicans, they're doing it through enlivening the biblical stories. Giotto's doing it through making his works seem more realistic. Now, it's worth noting here that uh, our painting in the National Gallery, our Giotto, may well have been an altarpiece for the church you see on your left in Santa Croce. We have an early uh, biography of Giotto, uh, written with a lot of sort of documentary evidence. Uh, some of it's a little dicey, but a lot of it's pretty accurate. That mentions there were something like seven different altars by Giotto in this church on the left, Santa Croce, which was the home church of the Franciscans in, in the city of Florence. This was the Franciscan church. 
and that Giotto worked for the Franciscans on a great number of occasions. Now, the painting on your right, being part of an altarpiece, uh, was part of a multi-paneled work that was actually split up sometime, we think, probably in the 18th and 19th century. A lot of it has since been lost, and the rest of this are split around in different uh, museums around the world. And ours was the center at the top, and it had you know, saints on either side sort of looking toward her. And down at the bottom, a series of, of narrative scenes. You can see the crucifixion of Christ directly beneath the Virgin and Child. Uh, you can maybe make out some others. There's near the Nativity scene. On the far left, actually, it's the Adoration of the Magi, right? Uh, just before the crucifixion, there's the Last Supper. Uh, there's Jesus in the tomb to the right of the crucifixion, and so forth and so forth, right? Uh, and this was then broken up by an art dealer who decided, why sell one picture when I can sell a dozen? And, and we got part of it at the National Gallery. So, again, we think about the historical context of this piece. We talk about why did Giotto make this change in style? First, there were these changes to society with the merchant class. Attendant to that, there were these changes to religious practice to address that merchant class with the mendicant orders, trying to make works of art, uh, their, or their sermons at least, seem, seem more realistic. Right? These two things seem to relate to the greater realism of Giotto's work. The third thing is the Renaissance. There is, in the late 13th century, around 1300, there's a revived interest in all of the art, visual, literary, history writing, ancient Rome. There's a huge interest in, in what was going on in ancient Rome, uh, a society that was lost for over a thousand years. Uh, and this revival of interest in ancient Rome is the Renaissance. The word Renaissance simply means rebirth. Uh, and what is being reborn is the ideals of ancient Rome, this interest in Roman art. Poets are reviving Roman themes. Giotto's interest in chiaroscuro, which we talked about before, this modeling in three dimensions. Um, is in fact based directly on his study of ancient Roman art. He'd been looking at mosaics, at frescoes, um, and seeing uh, a different way of depicting the human figure that was realistic and three-dimensional. There's no way he knew this work from Pompeii. It was still covered with uh, ash and lava at, in Giotto's time. It wasn't unearthed until the 19th century. But he would have seen other examples of Roman art, and he's now saying, hey, that's a great way of, of, of modeling the human figure in a three-dimensional way. Right? Now, it's important to note that Giotto's not making Roman art. He's doing Christian art still. He's not interested in Roman subjects. He's not even really interested in the sort of athletic body type that you see of the, center, uh, the figure in the center there, Mercury. Uh, these don't interest him at all. What interests him is the idea of chiaroscuro. The idea of a three-dimensional quality of art. So that's what we'll pick up uh, on Thursday when we get together. On Thursday in class, we'll look at the syllabus, we'll go over all those questions, and we'll pick up uh, with 14th century Italian art and move our way forward from there. But this then will make up for uh, our lost day to the snow. Hope you had fun playing out there. Be sure you play this back uh, before class. I'm going to email you around a little questionnaire. Uh, that you can use your notes to answer uh, and uh, ask certain questions of things that we covered here, just so I can be sure that you didn't you know, blow it off. Uh, so again, I'll see you in class on Thursday. I'm sure the snow will be all clear by then. Uh, have a good rest of the week.